Hello, and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver, and I'm a scientist, and this is Cindy Oliver, and she's in training to be a scientist. A while ago, I made a video that covered the various tricks that Dr. John Campbell uses to spread disinformation without getting censored by YouTube. And one of the tricks that I covered was that he pretends he is sharing information from official health department sources when he is, in fact, misrepresenting what they say. Well, he's at it again. This time, he has not only misrepresented what the CDC has said, but he goes on to misrepresent a scientific paper, an Australian Health Department document, and a scientist. Let's have a look. And also, I've been getting lots of questions on the new variant that seems to be emerging. And the CDC have said that people who um, could get this variant are actually more likely to get it if they've been vaccinated. So we're in a situation now where vaccination, according to the CDC, is increasing the likelihood uh, of infection. Quite incredible. And if you don't think those two things add up very well, then stick with it. Yes, it's quite incredible that the CDC would say this. Of course, they didn't. This is the report that John links to from his video. Let's have a look at what they actually said. I'll just read the relevant bit out to you. The large number of mutations in this variant raises concerns of greater escape from existing immunity from vaccines and previous infections compared with other recent variants. So they are not saying that vaccinated people are more likely to be infected than other people. They are saying they are more likely to be infected than they were with previous variants, as are those with immunity from previous infections. In other words, John is lying about what the CDC said, and he doesn't stop there. Now, I've copied this down verbatim from the Centers for Disease Control, BA-286, may be more capable of causing infection in people who have previously had COVID-19 or who have received COVID-19 vaccinations. Now, the way they've worded that, I do hope it's not disingenuous because we know that the mutations on this, uh, on this new variant are virtually all on the spike protein. And we know that the vaccine is specific to spike protein, so it's not surprising that the, the vaccine is causing trouble. We'll be looking at a minute in why it's actually probably causing more likelihood of infection. But if you've got natural immunity, you've got antibodies and resistance to membrane protein, envelope protein, nucleocapsid protein, genome proteins. It's polyclonal. So I really find that statement a little hard to understand from the Centers for Disease Control. Rather ironic that he accuses the CDC of being disingenuous. But John got one thing right here. He doesn't understand. It is true, of course, that natural infection will result in antibodies to all proteins in the virus rather than just the spike protein. But only antibodies to spike protein will prevent infection of cells because the virus uses spike protein to enter the cell. In fact, antibodies that prevent infection of cells are referred to as neutralizing antibodies. And it is when the number of these antibodies decrease either through natural contraction or evolution of the virus that you are more susceptible to infection. Of course, other components of adaptive immunity that you have gained from vaccination will still protect you from serious disease, even if you are infected. But more on that later. And the same adaptive immunity components will also protect you after infection, provided you survive the first infection. And if you want more evidence that the CDC is right and John is wrong, Dr. Yunlong Richard Kao, who is a scientist with expertise in biochemistry and immunology, has tested convalescent plasma from people infected with Omicron XBB. And he has shown that it has significant antibody evasion. The only one being disingenuous here is John vaccination has caused stimulation of the T suppressor, now called T regulatory cells. 
that down regulates the immune response um, is that what is happening this um, th this opposite effect of vaccination or is it that it repeated vaccinations are stimulating this rather new antibody we're learning about immunoglobulin g to immunoglobulin g type 4 now this um i've only heard about this in the context of rna viruses rna um um, vaccines messenger rna vaccines it didn't seem to arise after the adenovirus vector vaccines so it's maybe something specific it could well be another weakness of course in this whole uh whole trend to go towards mrna vaccines but how is this working well um, if there's increased um, immunoglobulin type 4 we know that immunoglobulin type 4 still goes to protect baby to some extent the unborn baby to some extent although with a vaccination, this will be a very short lived effect. And of course, there's the possibility that vaccine antibodies going into the baby might not be a good thing, always. Uh, neutralization, well, that still seems to work. So we can neutralize the spike proteins. But the systemic activation of complement is reduced. The opsoninization, op 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 let me explain that. Uh, an opsonin is, is a chemical that, that fits onto. Uh, to label uh, an antigen in preparation for um, immune destruction by the, uh, the the phagocytes of the immune system. So an anopsinin is basically uh, a label on an antigen saying, immune cells, please eat me. So opsonization is that this labeling with, with anopsinin, and that seems to be reduced. So there will be less of this cell eating. And this other one here um, seems to be reduced as well. This is uh, antibody-dependent cellular toxicity. In other words, the infected cells are less likely to be uh, eradicated. So good reason why repeated vaccination that's stimulating immunoglobulin type 4 might reduce um, immunity overall. Wow. There's a lot to unpack here starting with the fact that John is providing possible explanations for something that isn't happening. We know that vaccines definitely don't increase your risk of infection, and this has been shown in hundreds of studies. And this is just a recent one. In this study, they looked at the protection offered by vaccines, prior infection and hybrid immunity against SARS-CoV-2 infection in prison inmates. And they looked at three scenarios. Prisoners who had no known exposure to SARS-CoV-2, prisoners who were in the same cell block as a positive case, and prisoners who were in the same cell as a positive case. And this is what they found. They looked at both the Delta and Omicron periods separately. The Delta results are the forest plots on the left and the Omicron results are the forest plots on the right. The middle forest plots are comparing vaccinated with unvaccinated prisoners. Squares to the left of the vertical line mean that the vaccinated prisoners had a lower chance of infection than unvaccinated prisoners. And as you can see, this is a case of both no known exposure and cell block exposures for both the Omicron and Delta periods. For cell exposures, there is no significant difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated, although there is a trend towards vaccinated prisoners having a lower chance of infection during the Delta period. So what this suggests is that the vaccine can still protect you against infection in scenarios where you are likely to be exposed to a lower viral load but not when you are exposed to a high viral load. And this is also the case with prior infection and hybrid immunity. Rather different than what John is claiming. So let's now look at the possible reasons that John suggests for vaccines doing something that they don't. He first says it might be from vaccination stimulating T regulatory cells without providing any evidence of this whatsoever. He then moves on to IgG4 antibodies, where at least he does provide what seems on the surface to be evidence, but as usual, he's just misrepresenting 
scientific papers. John describes IgG4 antibodies as new and says he hasn't heard of them before and then speculates that maybe they are specific to mRNA vaccines. They're not. Here's a paper from 2002 that details how they occur after natural infection with measles. The figure that John shows about IgG4 comes from this short paper here. You probably won't be too surprised to know that he left out some rather pertinent information from the paper. Let me just read it out to you. It should be kept in mind that repeated boosting with mRNA vaccines has been protective, accurately deciphering the negative consequences, if any, of increased IgG4 levels will be difficult. IgG4 antibodies constitute a relatively small proportion of total anti-spike IgG after vaccination, will also likely be of higher affinity because they emerge late and can form mixed immune complexes with IgG1. In practical terms, they are unlikely to compromise immunity in vaccinated patients at this time. So did John not read the paper that he is presenting from, or is he just hoping that his viewers won't bother clicking on the link? So advice from the CDC, uh, get your COVID vaccinations as recommended. So you click on the link and you find out that uh, COVID vaccines are safe, effective and free. Now, it's a little surprising they said that. Let, let's just give counter, we can't disagree with the CDC, of course, we're not allowed to do that. But let's just give some, shall we say, counter-argument from uh, data from Western Australia. So this is the graph we've looked at a few times. Uh, this is here is where there was uh, previous vaccinations before COVID vaccinations. Uh, this was the reported adverse events on February uh, 2021 when COVID vaccines were introduced. And these, of course, are the mass of adverse uh, events that were reported in Western Australia. And yet, it seems they're completely safe in the United States. So it's a bit strange to me. I'm, I'm just a bit dozy, probably. Well, John said it. He's a bit dozy. Cindy's a bit dozy, too, at the moment. Now, we are allowed to disagree with that, and we can present a counter-argument. The counter-argument is that he's not dozy. He's just being disingenuous, although it's possible that he is both. And just to be clear, Cindy is never disingenuous, but she is sometimes a bit dozy. As John says, he has presented this chart a number of times. Not once has he provided the commentary that accompanies a chart and puts it in perspective. The high number of reports in 2021 following COVID-19 vaccination reflects higher uptake of COVID-19 vaccination and high engagement from the public and healthcare providers with the monitoring of vaccine safety. So there's a perfectly logical explanation for the increase in adverse event reports that has nothing to do with what John is trying to make out with his nudge, nudge, wink, wink stuff. And just to be clear, because John isn't, these are not reports of serious adverse events. These are reports of typical immune reactions like headache, lethargy, myalgia, which is sore muscles, injection site reactions, and chest pain. And chest pain means what it says. If it was something, if it was from something serious, that would be reported as well. Of course, there are also reports of rare, more serious adverse events, but that's not what is driving the increase in reports. So is John saying that reports of headaches and lethargy are reasons to think there is a problem with the vaccine? He certainly never used to think that. So, right. So th th that's what we're talking about, those systemic and local side effects. Now, the Pfizer, um, uh, people who had one dose of Pfizer, they, here they followed up 282,000 people. And of that 282,000 people, 13% had systemic side effects. 13% for the first dose of Pfizer and 71.9% had local side effects, mostly very mild. So 13% on the first vaccine for the Pfizer. 
Uh, for the second dose of the Pfizer, uh, 28,207 people were followed up who'd had the second dose of the Pfizer and their 22% developed side effects. So we see that more people get side effects with the second dose. So 13% got side effects with the first dose, systemic side effects, 22% with the uh, second dose of the Pfizer. So personally, I'm just uh, waiting incredibly impatiently for my second dose of Pfizer. But when I do, um, I'll have a 22% chance of getting systemic side effects, which is a price I'm more than happy to pay. So is John being dozy or disingenuous or both? I'll let you decide. Now, um, let's just get, this is from the same journal, uh, Nature. Jesse Bloom, viral evolutionary biologist, uh, Seattle. Um, now, uh, and this, is, this is in the journal. This is in, pu published in Nature. I don't think anyone needs to be alarmed by this. Yeah, it's another, it's just, it's another Omicron. The most likely scenario is that this variant fizzles out and in a month, nobody other than people like me even remember that it even existed. Uh, if BA286 does become widespread and proves adept at dodging neutralizing antibodies, which we will do because of um, uh, at least the, va the vaccine antibodies, uh, which seems to be likely on the basis of the spike mutations, other forms of immunity will probably stop most people from getting seriously ill if they are infected. So remember, the antibodies are just stimulating one very small aspect of the immune system, whereas natural immunity will be polyclonal and will give rise to protective um, cytotoxic killer cells and uh, T helper cells and various other uh, aspects, sensitized uh, um, macrophages and phagocytes. There's many forms of the immune system. So um, good to see that um, nature are quoting a scientist that's not worried about this. So those quotes from Jesse Bloom were all correct. He definitely said them. But notice that John tries to use them to suggest that Dr. Bloom agrees with him that only natural immunity is polyclonal and provides additional protection beyond neutralising antibodies. Dr. Bloom definitely doesn't agree with John. Here's a slide that he prepared that makes it clear that both infection and vaccination elicit polyclonal antibodies. As for T helper cells and killer T cells, it is well known that these are induced by vaccination as well as infection. They are not something that is unique to what John calls natural immunity. In fact, this paper here shows that Pfizer vaccination actually produces a more robust CD8 T cell response than. SARS-CoV-2 infection. Maybe John should have kept quiet about T-cells. And for those who don't know, CD8 T-cells are killer T-cells. And these work by destroying cells that are infected with SARS-CoV-2, which then stops those cells from producing more virus. So in summary, as per usual, Dr. John Campbell uses lots of official documents and scientific journal articles in his video, but completely misrepresents what they say. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked, shared, or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has supported us by buying me a coffee or little Cindy here a treat. We really appreciate your support. We will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to see them, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.